Hello, this is Leslie Russick. I am professor at in the physical therapy department at Clarkson University in Potsdam, New York, in the United States, and I do not have any conflicts of interest to report. So objectives, at the end of this presentation, hopefully you will better understand how your daily activities can contribute to pain and other symptoms, in particular, breathing correctly, sleeping better, and sitting and standing with less stress to your body. And hopefully you'll understand how physical therapy can help you to achieve these goals. So we're gonna start with breathing. And if you see the quote, you mean there's a wrong way to breathe? We usually don't think about breathing, but there is a wrong way to breathe. And we'll talk about why breathing correctly is important, about diaphragmatic breathing and what problems can happen when you don't do diaphragmatic breathing, the benefits of slow breathing, the importance of nose versus mouth breathing, and how physical therapy can help. So this is the diaphragm muscle. It's a dome-shaped muscle that connects to the ribs and the breastbone, and then it connects down to the lumbar vertebrae, and that's gonna be important for some of its functions. The diaphragm is the primary muscle for relaxed breathing. It coordinates with your abdominal and pelvic floor muscles, so the three have to work well together. It helps to stabilize the lumbar spine. When you have irritation of the diaphragm, it refers pain to your shoulders, but there are 14 plus other accessory breathing muscles that are helpful for or important for strenuous breathing, but that you may use if you're not breathing correctly at rest. So this is diaphragmatic breathing and feel free to try doing this as I describe it. So this picture on the left, um, shows where the dome of the diaphragm would be between your lungs and your belly. When the diaphragm pulls down, it pulls air in through the mouth into the lungs, but it pushes your belly guts out. And that's why diaphragmatic breathing is called belly breathing. When you exhale, the air comes out and normally the belly rebounds back in, but it requires some muscle tone in your abdominal muscles. A good way to learn diaphragmatic breathing if you don't do it naturally is to lie down, put your hand or a book on your belly, and when you inhale, your belly should go up, and when you exhale, your belly should drop back down again. Accessory muscles, I mentioned that there are 14 of them. I'm gonna talk about a couple of them that are common sources of pain. So in the neck, there's a muscle called the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And when it's overactive for breathing, it can cause headaches, ringing or fullness in your ear, sinus congestion, nausea, or dizziness. Scalene muscles in your neck as well, they attach to the ribs. When they are irritated and overused, they'll cause chest pain, back pain, and pain and numbness coming down the arm and hand. So what are some of the problems of diaph if you're not doing diaphragmatic breathing? Well, the accessory muscles are overused, as I just mentioned, and that can cause a number of symptoms. You can have problems with swallowing, swallowing or sleep apnea. You may have asthma, shortness of breath, decreased exercise or activity tolerance. You may have increased arch in your low back, lumbar or pelvic instability, low back muscle spasm, or low back or sacroiliac joint pain, weak hamstring and abdominal muscles, decreased heart function, decreased lymphatic fluid movement through the body, and that can lead to fluid buildup, particularly in your belly, and increased psychological stress due to an active sympathetic nervous system, which is bad. The diaphragm is particularly important for gut function because your stomach is right underneath the diaphragm and your intestines as well. And dysfunction in the diaphragm increases gastroesophageal reflux or GERD and diaphragmatic exercise is actually an effective treatment for GERD. A lack of coordination between the diaphragm and abdominal muscles is associated with irritable bowel syndrome, which is common in hypermobility. Decreased diaphragm function also increases the pain sensitivity in the gut. It can increase pain due to other problems in the gut. The diaphragm motion kind of massages the vagus nerve, which comes from your brain down to your gut. And this can help to decrease inflammation and gut-related pain. 
So slow breathing is also important and it's not mutually exclusive with diaphragmatic breathing. So the optimal function of your respiratory tract is at six breaths per minute. That's about five seconds in, five seconds out. Breathing slowly helps to improve diaphragmatic mobility and function, so you can do both at the same time. It improves the efficiency of breathing. It improves heart function. It improves heart rate variability, which is a measure of autonomic function and improved parasympathetic function, which is good. It improves your vagus nerve function, which improves gut function. It can improve your response to position changes like standing up, and this can be particularly helpful if you have POTS, and it can decrease blood pressure. Nose breathing is also important, better than mouth breathing for a number of reasons. It also improves function of the diaphragm. It helps to prevent illness by filtering the air. It can improve oxygen absorption, airflow, and blood flow in the lungs. It improves parasympathetic nervous system activity, which is good because that calms and relaxes the body, slows the heart rate and improves digestion. It can improve position of your tongue, which improves the alignment of your teeth. It decreases the likelihood of snoring and sleep apnea and can decrease temporomandibular joint problems. Something called 365 breathing is a good way to learn good breathing habits. And they say three times per day, although even once per day is helpful. You breathe six times per minute, which is five seconds in, five seconds out. And you do that for five minutes. And over a period of weeks, it'll actually change your nervous system to help calm your sympathetic nervous system, which can help to achieve benefits. And an interesting fact is that almost every culture in the world has a chant or a prayer that slows our breathing down to six breaths per minute. So in the Catholic tradition, Buddhist, yoga, Hindu, African, Hawaiian, all of these cultures have some type of a chant or prayer that slows the breathing down. So you can think that this must be something that's been important for thousands of years. So how can physical therapy help with breathing? Well, physical therapists are movement experts. Sometimes how you do things matters. We're all breathing, but how we breathe makes a difference. People with hypermobility have decreased body awareness and they may not realize they're breathing incorrectly or might not know what correct is. And there are at least 14 muscles involved in breathing and a physical therapist can help you figure out which are working properly and which are not. And some abnormal patterns of breathing are associated with specific pain complaints. And a PT can help link your pain complaint with specific breathing problems. And a PT can identify which breathing exercises are appropriate for you and make sure you're doing them correctly. And there are some resources here for breathing. Particularly interesting is this article by Andre on the health benefits of breathing properly. So I'm going to turn now to sleeping. And my quote here is, why is it so difficult to sleep? Because sleeping is often a challenge for people with hypermobility. So we'll talk about the importance of sleep, pain management at bedtime, positioning in bed, how to deal with nighttime subluxations, sleep hygiene, and how physical therapy can help. So why is sleep important? Well, it improves brain function, learning, and memory. It improves emotional well-being pain management. We know that sleep deprivation increases pain sensitivity, turns the volume up. It improves physical health in a number of ways. It improves your body's ability to heal from injury or illness, and it improves your immune function. It can help with weight control by regulating hunger hormones and insulin, and so it can decrease obesity. It improves your energy, and it improves your function and safety during the day when you're not groggy. So managing nighttime pain is a common problem. And the picture here shows a body pillow that can help you position. We'll talk about that more in detail. So managing nighttime pain starts with managing daytime pain through things like posture, proper exercises, body mechanics, et cetera. A hot bath, heat, ice, topical rubs, tens, otherwise known as an electro massager before bed, can sometimes help to manage nighttime pain. 
doing relaxation exercises, gentle movements or muscle stretches can be helpful. Things that are helpful for physiological quieting to decrease nerve sensitization, things like meditation, slow breathing, something called binaural music where you hear different things in each ear, sleep yoga, etc. Using optimal body position support and padding like this pillow. For some people, weighted blankets can be helpful, especially for people who struggle to sleep because of anxiety or depression. And then of course, pain medications if necessary. So the ideal bed support can be a real challenge for people with hypermobility because we're really sensitive. I call it the princess and the pea syndrome. So ideally we want the spine to be straight if you're lying on your side and we look from the back. If you're lying on your back, we want the spine to have its normal curves in it. Pressure should be distributed across the body. So this picture on the upper right shows that there's support under the head, shoulder, waist, hips, and legs. And this picture in the middle shows support under the knees as well as the head. A bed that's too soft is shown here on the left and you get this hammock effect where your body bends sideways. And this of course is not good for your spine to spend hours in this side bent position. But a bed that's too hard is also a problem, that it can cause your spine to curve abnormally, especially for women with hourglass figures as this cartoon shows. But it also causes pressure points, particularly at the shoulders and the hips and the bottom leg, which can cause pain. And it causes the top leg to drop down, stretching out the structures on that leg. Well, if your bed's not ideal, we can't all just go out and buy a new bed. So consider a bed topper or pillows to provide you with support. The bed toppers can distribute weight more evenly. There are a lot of options and different people like different things. So memory foam down, fleece, egg crate, et cetera. And the proper bed topper for you would depend on your sleep position, whether you're a side sleeper or a back sleeper or a belly sleeper, your body size and type, and what your particular complaints are, whether it's the pressure on your body that hurts or whether it's the poor alignment of your body that causes pain. And I have listed here a couple of reviews of bed toppers if you're interested. Neck pillows are also very important, just like the low back, we want the neck to be lined up. So these pictures um, in the, on the right-hand side show that on the side, you want your neck to be straight. And if you're lying on your back, you want to have the normal curves to your spine. You don't want a pillow that's too thick that pushes your head in one direction. And you don't want a pillow that's too low that allows your head to drop down. So there's no universal best pillow for everyone because it depends on your body type and what position you sleep in. So whether you're a back sleeper, side sleeper, stomach sleeper, you would need a different type of pillow. But the goal is that your neck should be aligned with your spine. It's also important to support your body in bed. And this can help to decrease tissue compression by distributing your body weight. So here are some examples. So a common area of complaint is the bottom shoulder. Shoulders were not designed to be slept on. They're designed to move the arm around. So the pillow here on the left shows um, that there's a space for the shoulder to go through. There's support for the head. So there's decreased pressure on the shoulder. Um, to protect the shoulder. In the middle, there's a picture of a waist pillow that helps to support her waist. And this achieves a couple of goals. One, it helps her spine to be lined up because she has an hourglass figure and we don't want her bent sideways, her body adapting to the bed. But it also decreases weight on her shoulder and hips so it can decrease that compression pain. The picture on the right top shows using a pillow between the legs, and this helps to prevent the muscles in the hip from being wrung out by the leg dropping down too much. And the bottom right picture shows a body pillow, which can be very helpful, especially for stomach sleepers, because we don't want your head turned all the way to the side if you're a stomach sleeper. So the body pillow lets you put your weight 
onto the body pillow and keep your head lined up. So nighttime subluxations, it's possible for your joints to slip out of place at night when the muscles relax. You can prevent this before bed, of course, by strengthening, stabilizing muscles, stretching tight muscles, improving your posture. But when you're in bed, you can use pillows to support your limbs, as we've talked about. Position your joints in mid-range, not stretch them. In this picture of a hand brace shows how you position them in mid-range. You can decrease the weight of blankets on your joints. So the ankles can actually sublux by, from the weight of the blanket. And this little prop helps to hold the blankets up. And you can consider sleeping with braces. Cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, so CBTI, is shown to be at least as effective as medication to help improve sleep. And so this is a strategy that you can use to improve sleep. The CBTI is just one of many apps that are available, but it's free. It has a sleep self-assessment tool. It has sleep 101 education with information about healthy sleep, and it has some tools for relaxation. But there's a review of other insomnia apps listed here. Sleep hygiene is important. There are a number of do's, using your bedroom only for sleep and intimacy, regular schedule, exercise, exposure to bright light, keeping the bedroom cool and quiet, having a wind down routine. And there are some don'ts, things to avoid eating, avoiding naps, avoiding computers, phones, and tablets with blue light before bedtime, and avoiding lying in bed awake. If you can't sleep, get up, go somewhere else and do something boring. POTS can also disturb sleep. It can wake you up at night if you have a POTS episode because your body releases adrenaline and your heart starts to beat. So some management ideas, general pot self-management, doing some relaxation activities at bedtime to calm your sympathetic nervous system. So things like breathing, yoga, meditation, elevating the head of your bed can help decrease your need to go to the bathroom at night by helping to retain fluids. Sleep disordered breathing, so things like sleep apnea, are six times more common in people with hypermobility than the general population. So some strategies. Changing your sleep position can help. So half of sleep apnea is due to sleeping on your back, so shifting to slide, side sleeping. And then improving your breathing overall, so diaphragmatic breathing, nose breathing. And of course, CPAP, the continuous positive airway pressure, is the standard treatment. How can physical therapy help with sleep? Well, PTs are experts in body alignment. They can help you determine optimal sleep position to minimize stress to your body. They can help with pain management through teaching you posture, body mechanics, joint alignment, educating you about self-management strategies, help with POTS management, help teach you to breathe to decrease sleep apnea, encourage you to exercise and empower you to exercise, which improves the quality of your sleep, and here are some resources for sleep management. So sitting and standing, I often hear patients say, but I wasn't doing anything when the pain started. And this is particularly common for patients who come in with headaches. I wasn't doing anything, but we're always somewhere. We always have a posture. Our head is always somewhere. So we're going to talk about forward head and text neck. We'll talk about some common causes of pain from sitting posture, some trigger points, and the role of being sedentary on pain sensitivity. So why is sitting posture important? Well, static positions that you maintain for a long time put a lot of stress on joints and muscles. And you can imagine for this gentleman, his upper back and neck are hanging on their muscles and joints. The prolonged stretch can cause more damage than a short-term stretch. So we call this tissue creep where the tissues get longer if you put a gentle load on them for a long time. And the prolonged stretch can compromise blood flow to the muscles, which can cause pain. Poor sitting posture can cause headaches, neck pain, upper and lower back pain, decreased energy and mood, and poor breathing patterns. Two common bad postures are forward head and text neck, and they place excessive forces on the joints and muscles. They can lead to muscle spasm and trigger points, cause compression of nerves in the neck and even compression of the spinal cord structures. So if we think about the head weighing 12 pounds, imagine it like a bowling ball. And if you held a bowling ball straight over your spine, it would be fairly easy to hold. 
But once the head is two inches forward of the spine, the weight of the head is as though it's 32 pounds. And if your head is four inches forward, it feels like it's 42 pounds. And of course, these muscles and joints are going to be stressed. Plus, if your head is forward, you have to cock your head backwards to be able to see. And if that's the equivalent of having your head tipped backwards, and of course, that's going to hurt. We have a new diagnosis that's been named text neck because of all the time we spend looking down at our devices. Again, the 12 pound head can weigh the equivalent of 50 pounds if you have your head tipped forward 45 degrees. Trigger points are a common result and the picture here shows many of the common trigger points in the neck that can cause headaches. So pain may be due to trigger points. Trigger points in turn may be due to poor posture tensing the muscles or stress. Poor posture in turn may be due to weak stabilizing muscles, the deep neck flexors in particular. Those weak stabilizing muscles and overuse of the superficial muscles can be due to poor motor control or coordination of the muscles. And that poor coordination might be due to poor body awareness because people who are hypermobile have decreased body awareness. So you can see posture is fairly complex, that it's not just a, oh, I decide to sit up straight. There are a lot of reasons why it might be difficult for us. Good sitting posture, we want the head over the shoulders, over the back, ideally with a good back support, and we want to be looking straight forward. Driving posture is also important. Ideally, we want the head lined up with the shoulder and the back. We want good back support and we want to ideally use the head's headrest support. We want to avoid prolonged sitting. So being sedentary decreases the muscle strength that you need for joint stability and function, decreases energy, contributes to fatigue and sleep problems, increases risk of heart disease, and other medical conditions, and it increases your sensitivity to pain and your likelihood of developing chronic pain. Prolonged sitting also aggravates POTS. So what can you do? Get up and move, even if it's just for a few minutes every hour, walk around, dance and wiggle. You can do chair exercises if standing is not safe for you, wiggling in your chair. You can do sitting yoga. The picture here shows one example. You can do sitting dances, sitting Tai Chi, et cetera. So standing. Standing doesn't seem so hard. Why does it hurt so much? So we'll talk about good standing posture, some common problems caused by standing, and how physical therapy can help with sitting and standing posture. So ideally, standing posture has the head over the shoulders, over the hips, over the knees, over the ankles. Two common postures that I see in people who are hypermobile are shown in the middle of these four diagrams. So the one here, the second from the left, shows what happens when the body collapses into gravity, and especially if you're hypermobile, and especially if the muscles aren't well toned. You get too much curvature of your upper back, too much arch to your low back, the hips are flexed, the head is forward. This can be aggravated by tight hip flexors and tight low back muscles. The other common posture I see in people who are hypermobile is called sway back. And this is where we hang on the ligaments to be to use less energy standing. So this person has the hips swung forwards. She's hanging on those hip ligaments. She's hanging on her knee ligaments, hanging on her back. And this causes these structures to be overstressed and compresses the spine. Low back pain is common. It may be due to the poor posture that allows the back to arch too much, as I mentioned, hanging on the ligaments or compressing the nerves. The muscles tense to brace an unstable spine, poor body awareness, using muscles improperly, not using the diaphragm muscle, as we talked about before, and having tight hip muscles. And the picture on the bottom here shows the hip muscles go from the thigh bone to the spine. And when they're tight, they pull the back the spine forward in that excessive lordotic posture I showed you. Trochanteric pain in the hip is another common problem from standing posture. It tends to happen when we drop one side of our pelvis and the muscles that go over this bone in our hip are stretched out. 
The picture here on the right shows how the hip abductor muscles come around this bump on the bone called the trochanter. There's the trochanteric bursa. And when the pelvis is dropped down, these structures are squeezed over that bump of bone. It can happen because of muscle weakness if you're too weak to hold your pelvis level, but it can also happen from poor body awareness if you simply don't realize that you're doing it or don't know that it's not appropriate. The muscles and tendons become overstretched, the bursa is compressed. It can also be aggravated by flat feet, which turns the knees and hips inward, pulling on the hip muscles and tendons. And so orthotics may be helpful to align the whole leg to decrease stress on the hip. Patellofemoral pain is also a common problem from standing. So the kneecap here can become painful. It can happen when there are loose ligaments in the kneecap, allowing the kneecap to move too much. Standing with hyperextended knees allows the kneecap to float out of position, tight thigh muscles, pull the kneecap out of alignment. Flat feet allow the legs to roll inward, which pulls the knee out of alignment as well. And weak hip muscles also allow the hip to rotate and the leg to rotate. So how can physical therapy help? Well, PTs are experts on how posture affects joints, muscles, nerves, and why your alignment is not right. They can evaluate your sitting and standing posture and joint alignment and evaluate your muscle strength, flexibility, and motor control to help figure out how to correct your posture and figure out why you hurt where you hurt and why posture or how posture contributes. They can teach you proper posture, body mechanics, and ergonomics. They can give you exercises to improve your body awareness and joint position sense or proprioception, teach you exercises for motor control so you're using and relaxing the correct muscles. It's just as important to relax muscles that shouldn't be working as it is to use muscles that should. They can teach you self-management strategies and help you figure out when orthotics and braces can be helpful. They can give you specific exercises to strengthen weak muscles or carefully stretch tight ones, ensure that you're doing your exercises correctly and provide hands-on therapy to address imbalances and pain. And here are some resources for sitting and standing. So in summary, in managing daily life, the little things really matter. How you breathe, sleep, sit and stand, it adds up because we spend a lot of hours doing these things. People with hypermobility are at increased risk of doing these things poorly, which increases pain and other symptoms. These activities are actually quite complicated in the demands they place on our body. And it can be hard to figure out what you're doing wrong and why. And physical therapists are movement experts and experts in how we use our bodies. And they can help you learn how to better manage daily life. I have my references here. And thank you very much for listening to me.